All right, everyone. Hey, welcome. Uh, I'm just taking a second to get set up. Let me know if everything's coming through okay. You might see me glancing off to the side occasionally. I'm just checking on my stream chat, checking on my microphone, making sure everything's coming through. So if I'm too quiet, uh, my levels look good, but just let me know in the chat. Uh, and welcome to everyone who's tuning in. So basically what, my name is Ian Boyd. I work for the libraries. I'm a library technician that works uh, in the newly created Innovation Studio, which is a kind of like a technology and project showcase in the libraries, but it's interactive and it's using um, basically depth cameras and webcams to create a, a curative museum space, basically in the library where students or faculty and staff from the university can show off their work. And some of that work, like um, doing exhibits, I kind of do interactive design, interactive exhibitions. So what I wanted to do right now is kind of go through this software that I've recently found out about, relatively recently, and kind of uh, evangelize it and talk about it because it's a super cool piece of software and I really just like want to show it off. And that software is called Touch Designer. Um, and I've had tons of people kind of ask me like what Touch Designer is, you know, like how would you describe it? And there's not a really good way to do it because it's so different from like most of the other software I've used like in the past. And like one level it's used, I mean, I guess you could describe it, it's excels at creating like interactive content, interactive displays, generative art, you know, kind of like a, like a game engine would. Um, but on the other hand, it can be used for so much more than that. Like it's basically just like the glue that can hold together so many like different projects um, and different media, like splice them together, take inputs, you know, from a sensor and then translate that to a reaction like on a, like a projection mapped, you know, wall piece. Like it's just a super cool uh, piece of software. And I've got a bunch of examples and demos to show everyone today, just kind of talking about it. Um, and then like, just so you can get an idea of like kind of what the software is, what it can do, and everything like along those lines. Um, so on its basic level, Touch Designer is a node-based uh, coding environment. So if you're familiar with something like processing, um, it's very similar to kind of like the things you can do in processing, except rather than work uh, in a, like a traditional scripting environment, like in a text editor, you're actually working in this node-based environment. Um, anytime that you open Touch Designer for the first time, you're going to see this kind of setup. It's the, the dancing jelly beans, right, like that you have right here. So like I'm just pulling them up on my screen. And it gives you kind of a, an idea of what Touch Designer can do, like at a, at a basic level. So you've got a channel. Uh, basically, this is just a noise. It's putting input somewhere between zero and then one up here. Um, and that's just moving along in a sine wave randomly. That noise is being converted to a uh, a top, which is a texture operator, um, which then can be combined with this static image that we have of jelly beans under this movie file, and that you notice the movie file is being, the image is being displaced along the same operators as the channel, which then can be mapped onto a geometry and used as a texture. So you have this very nice uh, cube that now has a dancing texture on it, and then we can output that to our final presentation, which we have up here. Uh, so it's a very simple example, but it kind of shows you a little bit about what we're talking with. Um, and then you see some more things around the, the panel. You've got our FPS is running very smoothly at 60 frames a second. And this is all being run in real time. Uh, Touch Designer is a real time run environment that basically you can do lots of real time interaction with. So that's like all well and good that when you open this for the first time, but uh, it doesn't give you a lot about what Touch Designer is. So each of these little nodes that you see in here have just a bunch of different parameters. So like you see that like I just have like all these settings that like I can mess with along all of them. Like they each have just different scaling I can do. Like I could really like step up the seat. Well, the seat doesn't matter, sorry. I could like really step up the period, slow it down, you know, make it really fast. Um, but this is just showing that like every node has a bunch of parameters and every node basically functions as a Python function. This is all written inside of Python and you can also um, like use uh, Python code to like mess with anything. So if you notice if I open up any of these parameters, like I can modify this like with like a simple Python script. Seconds time point one, and then like all of a sudden like now I can do that. Oh, seconds is probably too slow. <laughs> Let's go frames. Yeah, it was just flatlined. 
but it doesn't matter because like it's always doing it, it's just incrementing very slowly upwards. Uh, but I just wanted to show as an example that you can put in any kind of Python scripts here and then like modify your things. Uh, and then what really is like awesome is when everything's working together in tandem. So to start with, this is pretty boring. I don't want to do just like uh, like a base intro right off the bat. I actually want to show you some projects that I've developed and it give you kind of an idea about like what this this software can do. So let's do this mouse instancing one to start with. Uh, we'll just load it. Don't need to save this. Okay. So on this end, let me. Whoops. Spoiler alert. Let me jump back to my presentation file. Yeah, cool. So you can see just just the window here. So what you've got is like a uh, cube grid that I've generated and put up here. And then if I click anywhere in this grid, it's going to displace these interactively in real time. And it's doing this. Basically, I can click and drag and draw. I can go around the edges. And this is all running at 60 frames a second, like in Touch Designer. This could all be mapped on a wall. Um, it could be done up. Right now, it's using mouse and keyboard input. Um, but it doesn't have to, right? Like it could use like my hand. And later on, I'm going to show you like some examples, like where I'm using sensors. And that's like a really strong suit of Touch Designer is like its ability to use sensors and input. So now, like anywhere that I go in here, you'll see that like I'm displacing these cubes interactively as I go. And what does this look like? You know, if we jump back into Touch Designer, well, this is what a more complicated node network would look like, and it gives me kind of an opportunity to jump through some of the high points and show you um, like what the things you can do at the same time. So don't worry if this looks like intimidating at the front. You'll notice that it's like running in the background as I click and drag. Uh, the reason for that is because Touch Designer always runs in real time, like your um, instances are always going. So even as I'm working on it, I can preview this interactivity and kind of showcase it as I go. But we can turn off this background right now. We don't really need it. Um, you'll notice that like the nodes like that render, like this is my final render node. Um, if I turn it on, like you can see the same thing. Like you can see it like still displacing like on the final render node. So just to kind of go into how this works and like hit kind of the fine points of this, um, like it looks overwhelming at first, but I kind of kind of break down what what um, goes into like making this happen. So at the first level is that you need some interactivity. And that comes from this mouse in node, which is right over here. And what this is doing is we've created a circle just out here with the circle operator um, that basically is tracked using this mouse node. So basically if I move it up, you know, like you can see right here the TY is controlling you know the y axis if you think about it a grid y is y is up x is left and right up and down left and right x and y so right now you see as i move my mouse up and down it's displacing that interactively and it's also displacing this circle and you can we can put it back here so right here you've just got kind of a basic circle uh, you can use it as a painting app actually I, I built it really fast in the past like you can just make a painting app and touch designer instantly um, but i'm displacing a circle Right now, I've used a level, um, and the, basically all the level is controlling, as I can show you here, is the opacity. So the opacity is linked to left click. So you also have this other channel, my mouse input. So if I can click, then my mouse shows up. And this is good because I only want my um, geometry to be displaced when the mouse is clicking. So you can see on here. If I hold and drag, then you can see it. But it also makes you sick because I'm moving my screen around. From here, what I'm doing is I'm creating a feedback loop. And I can talk a little bit about feedback later. But basically, um, what feedback does is it draws frames on top of each other. So whenever I click the mouse, because I've created this um, instance on there, you'll see that it's pushing out the creation in a circle. Uh, because as the feedback goes, like it's just expanding where that line has drawn. And it pushes it across the whole thing. And then I've done some stuff to help refine that. And make it stronger. So now what I have is basically after another level node, I've made a really strong displacement effect. And what this is, is that basically if you think about uh, it like a height map, um, basically if this was black, everything wouldn't be displaced at all. Uh, everything would just be at zero. But at white, everything moves up. Um, and it moves up a pre predetermined amount. And I can show you that as we go. So basically, the whole interaction between that is because I'm drawing a 2D texture uh, when I click my mouse, and it's expanding in rings, like outside. 
Now it wouldn't be enough to do this just with textures. You could, but I'm actually using these channels as well. So what you'll see is basically um, in Touch Designer, anything can be converted into anything else. So I've got this fit right here, and then I'm converting it just to channels. So what you look at here, this is going to be super big. Uh, let me just scroll through real fast. But basically, if you see this, I've created this as a grid where everything is a pixel value. So sorry, like if you've like totally, if I've totally lost you, but this is just, you don't have to understand everything right now. It's just to kind of show like the steps. But basically you see as I click, you're seeing that the pixels are being displaced as a channel operator. And that's because I have just clicked my mouse. And so that's showing um, the every pixel. Right now I've created this grid. You see it's very pixelized here. It's on a 30 by 30 grid. So there's, uh, what's 30 by 30? 900? There's 900 pixels on here. 30 on the x-axis, 30 on the y-axis. So as I click, each of those pixel values gets put onto a grid that I have created. Let me find my grid up here. So basically all this is, is I've created a 30x by 30y grid um, that creates the base geometry on here. So let me see if I can blow this up. Yeah. So you see right here, all these grids right here, um, each one has been populated with just a cube. Like it's just been stretched out. And as I click, wherever that white value goes across, because remember the physical space, 30 by 30 on my grid is the same size as this um, bitmap that I'm drawing. Wherever white appears, it's gonna draw across and push that up. So whenever I left click and drag, it'll displace it. And you can see that on these channel operators. Basically all I'm doing here is just using some math on them because we can make this much bigger. So I did from zero to 0.4. Um, the channel operators just basically let me control like the displacement on here. So I could go to two and watch what this does. <laughs> yep. So instead of displacing it 0.4 in the y direction, it's displacing it two in the y direction, which looks absolutely crazy. You could also do the opposite. I could go negative 0.4, and now it's going to soak in like a crater rather than go up above. Um, and I guess like, yeah, massive spike, absolutely, like as you go. And so basically that you can create a lot of effects very easily and it's very like modular and programmable. So like any of these nodes, like I could just cut out and like basically put somewhere else, you know, like I could like put them, um, in another project, I could use these like as code, like forward. And basically all this is, is just a visual, um, like visual node-based coding environment is basically all it is. I have some other stuff in here, like the PBR like controls the texture, you know? So like if I wanted like everything to be red, like it could, um, not that important for like what I'm doing, but um, just like different nodes that are in here, the grids, grid controls. Uh, this is the box that I'm instancing. So if you notice, let me kill this real fast. If you notice, my grid is just a plane. Let's see. I just want to load it. It's going to let me. Yeah, well, that's okay. My grid is just a plane on here. Let me just zoom in real fast. You can see. Like, that's all it is, and it's just a 30 by 30 grid, like of points. That's, it's, it's nothing special. Uh, what makes it cool is that I've instanced all these boxes across the grid. So I just took a basic box like this and then I've used it to create like this giant grid. And it didn't have to be boxes, right? Like, um, like I could have used anything. Like I can go to my box right now and I can change it. Like I can delete the box. Hold on one sec. Hopefully this doesn't break everything, but if it does, it'll be funny. Okay, so instead of a box, we could have just put like a sphere. Let's just plug this in. See what this looks like. Ooh, I think this is gonna look weird. Yep, all right, so now you have a 30 by 30 grid of spheres and everything displaces the exact same way, right? Like, um, because you still have the same thing and it's still moving. So like, I guess I'm like, the whole setup here is just like, like look how easy it is to change stuff around. You know, like, like if you're like in a game engine or like doing this in processing, like, oh my gosh, I, I don't even wanna think about it. But like, I can make these changes like, on the fly, like I have all of them, like it's all in front of me. So like, I don't know, I'm just very like interested in like, I don't know, cause I have never heard about this software before. Like I've never heard about it, like or doing anything with it, but 
ever since I've been doing it, I've just been doing like tutorial after tutorial, just kind of trying to explore more of what I can do. And like, I'm just like super impressed with like everything you can get out of Touch Designer. Yeah, procedural code. Can I do pyramids? Uh, I could model one. Like, let's see if like there's one in here. I don't think there's a primitive that's a pyramid inside of Touch Designer, but you can just import like any geometry you want. Like, you know, like you could do like the blender monkey or anything, like it doesn't matter. I don't know if I have a good software on this, like a good, like, uh, I don't know if I have a good mesh just to throw up here on this software. What does it do Metaball? I just want to see. Yeah, that's not as cool as I thought. Metaballs uh, can like merge in with each other. Like, I guess we could make the grid a little thicker. Hold on. So it's a 30 by 30 grid. Um, I could just make a pointy primitive if you just give me a second, but let me see. Uh, da, 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 da. I just need my parameters. Oh, this is my null, sorry. I need my constant. So we could go something like 90. Yeah. And then we could also go negative in there as well. So like, again, like my grid is scalable, like my grid controls are right here, like procedural, like you said, procedurally. Um, so like I can start like you know drawing this in with this. This computer has a really good GPU. I should I should note Touch Designer is uh, if you want to run it, remember everything's in real time. Um, still running this 60 frames a second. We can try to push it a little bit. Like what if we went like 150? This uh this computer has yeah we're starting to hit a little performance snag now 58. Uh this computer is done. Yeah that's awesome. I love it. My laptop can't do this. I'll just have to say so like what I'm doing it. But um if you have a really good GPU on your computer, I know they're hard to get right now, but um you can do a lot of really cool effects with it. And like all I'm doing now is just scaling up you know the grid and the points and like that's all that I'm doing. So we can take it back down to 30 by 30. But yeah you can mess with this um. Like anyway, so this is just one example. I've got a lot, I just wanna kinda of show, but this is like a baseline of interactivity. And again, like what's driving this is my mouse and keyboard in this circle, but it doesn't have to be. Like I could do anything, like I could drive it with anything, you know, um, as long as I have like a white point, you know, that's displacing it. Um, like you could be doing like all kinds of stuff. So like I said, like I've got this um, depth camera right now, which later on, like, I'll show you that we could, like, use this to drive it, you know, so, like, if you had a camera just, like, up in your scene, like, instead of driving it um, with this circle, I could drive this whole thing with my hand, right, like, I could, like, wave over it. I have an Arduino right here on the floor, distance center uh, pointometer. All of this has native support inside of Touch Designer. I have a Leap Motion controller. So if you wanted to do like hand tracking, like or anything on this, um, you could just plug in a leap motion and have it control like this displacement. When installing the free version, it asks for a sign in. All right, so yeah, I just saw it in chat. Um, so yeah, awesome for like already checking it out and going to see if you want to install it. But um, so what it is, is this is a non-commercial version. Um, so what the non-commercial version will ask for is Touch Designer controls the licensing through its website, like through its profile. So what you need to do is go on to Touch Designer's site and create a uh, profile with them. And as soon as you have that profile, it will connect it to a license generator. And I think you get like eight free keys. So you can install Touch Designer like for free on eight machines. Um, I will say like that the only lock like in Touch Designer is that um, you are locked at your resolution. So like, I think the max you can do is like 1280 by 1280, like in your rendered resolution, which is honestly pretty good, uh, like for all intents and purposes. Like this is a thousand by 1000. I think right now it's a thousand by thousand cube. So um, this gets important because Touch Designer like is like um, a truly real time, like infinite canvas. Like as long as your GPU can render it, like you can um, make your Touch Designer canvas as big as you want with the professional version. This becomes important because Touch Designer, a lot of this stuff is projected. Like Touch Designer has really good projection mapping tools. So like if you wanted to like throw this like, you know, interactive like little tool I've made like on the side of a building, like you could, right? And you could control it all, you know, from Elite Motion like at like your station that you set up. Um, but just know that the one restriction on the free version is that rather than like get that infinite render space, you only have a 1280 by 1280 max. Um, I usually do 1280 by 720, like if I'm gonna project anything, cause usually that's good enough. But if you wanted something like really nice and big, um, you would need to upgrade. But yeah, for installing, just create a, just create a user profile 
on um, Derivative's website, the Touch Designer website, and um, then you can get into your key manager and get the key from there. So, yeah, cool, cool. All right, so um, so this is one example, and I've kind of showed, but like what I was saying is that you can drive this with anything, like any transform. Like, I don't know if I want to break this too hard right now. I'd rather show some more examples. But like what I could do is just go in with any kind of white bitmap and then just use that to drive it instead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maude, for throwing the, the link to the website. Um, so real fast, I'm going to open up, I think, another project just to kind of show like the variation. So this one was more 3D based. Like we're doing like more of a 3D design. Um, maybe we keep in with the 3D, but we use a different thing to drive it instead. Let me see. Instant sculpture would be good. Flex solver. I had a. I think it's an old project. Hold on. Yeah, we can do an audio spectrum. So another thing that Touch Designer excels at working at is that um, basically. Let me see. I have to make sure that you guys can hear this because it's it's dri it's driven off of audio. But we're just going to load in another 3D kind of style project. So give it a second. It's going to take a sec to load in. But basically, um, Touch Designer also works off of, uh, it's really good at working with audio, like really reactive with audio. You saw that I was using channels to drive the animation. All an audio file is is a series of channels, like being input. So like Touch Designer is really great at working with like audio responsive projects too. Um, so I made like a visualization on here, you know, like the kind of thing that you would see, um, like, I don't know, like on a VJ set, you know, or something like that. Or like with your, uh, like if you're around in 2000, like on your window, like audio player, you know, like it had like a visualization you could turn on. This is a little cooler than that. Yeah, audio reaction. Yeah, if you love audio reaction, you should check the software out. Like it's great. I like making audio reactive things. Uh, and you can do it real time too. So like, say you had like a MIDI controller. Um, so you're not rendering out like an audio reactive stuff. Like everything's happening in real time. You're doing it real time. Um, and if you have a MIDI controller, like it's super good at like interacting with Touch Designer because everything that, you know, comes off of MIDI, I will admit I'm not the best, like um, the biggest audio person. Like I'm more of a, a 3D art kind of, kind of guy, but, um, like, my understanding is that, like, everything that comes off a MIDI controller is just controlling channels, right? Like, it's controlling channels. And then all these channels could be manipulated and animated inside of Touch Designer. Um, I hope it didn't crash. I just want to see. Give me one second. It shouldn't take this long to load. I'm just going to take it down one sec, and then I'm going to load in another one. Generally, um, I don't have problems with touch designer crashing. Usually it's only on project load or th things like that. It's actually very stable in my experience. Like if you're like running something physically, like you shouldn't, you shouldn't have crashes. Now that's not entirely true because uh, you can push your computer to its limits. Like you can push your computer like, because touch designer will let you, right? Like it'll let you blow up your GPU. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't hold your hand in that way. So if you like like say I put like 150 by 150 did you, between an audio reactor and a game engine. Well, this is um, so Maude, I'm glad you asked that question. Like because that's like super what Touch Designer is good at is being the bridge between other uh, applications. So like I'll run through. Um, you can use software like Spout, and um, I don't know if you know about Spout or Siphon. But Spout is basically a um, display sharing application that will put input from one uh, application to another. So you can use a Spout to uh, pipe in like the feed from like an Unreal Engine 4, like game engine, and then connect it inside of Touch Designer to like an audio controller, um, you know, that you're running or plugged into the USB. And then uh, after that, you can like control like that game engine, like through Touch Designer, using the Touch Designer input um, in Unreal Engine 4. And Unreal Engine 4 actually has native support for Touch Designer built into it. I think it's called Touch Engine. Um, but it's just crazy at how well like Touch Designer like lets you work in between applications. Yeah, Spout, awesome. And then it's called Siphon on Mac. Uh, but Spout is the one I'm talking about. 
uh, an audio reactor and applying that to a game. You can also, also, a lot of game engines will let you do like audio reactivity in them now, like natively. You don't need to use Touch Designer, but like, um, but it's cool that you can. And Touch Designer is really good at like configuring like controls and stuff like that. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. I was trying to open a project. Like I should be doing this like after I click open. Okay, let's try one more time. Audio deformation. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So this is running through the course of a song. Um, let me make sure. Oh no, I hope I can find it. Let's see. So right now my audio file is broken because I brought it on here, but I think I can just grab it. Give me one sec. Yeah, don't worry about it. Touch designer. And if not, I'll just grab a different audio file because it works with anything, right? Like it doesn't have to be here. Yeah, it's this one little story, okay. Yep, there's our WAV file. Okay, so that'll start everything. All right, cool. So what this is is basically it's an audio range that's being displaced. Yeah, UE4 and Touch Designer Link. Yeah, and so you can work within the two of them. Um, let me see if I can get you guys some desktop audio on here. Let me turn it down a little bit so it doesn't like blow you out because it's uh, not as cool hearing it if you can't hear. So this is my audio controls. One, give me one second. Can you guys hear that? Isn't, I'm not blowing you out, am I? But basically what I have, um, there is sound. <laughs> is there enough sound? I can make it uh, louder if I need to. All right, cool. Um, so basically what I'm doing here is I'm piping the channel inputs through this uh, 3D structure. And you notice I'm converting it again, like to this white one, which is displacing, but it's doing it along it's doing it along the uh, displacement and it's also coloring it as you go. So like right now it's just triggered. And then there's some like other post-processing effects. Like there's a depth of field on this as well. Um, but you can see like your like your like snare and drums are like on the uh, right hand side of the screen and your bass is like more down here. And basically all I've created is an audio displacement spectrum right here that is constantly scrolling through like in playing this. So what I'm doing now is just like making this audio visual. You can hit boom, 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 boom. But basically everything that's running it is just running off of here. And I've just, um, the only reason I have this many is because I'm rendering out a bunch of maps. So like here's a normal map. Here's my displacement or height map. You know, like that's creating it and driving this whole thing. Um, and then down here is like my coloring and depth of field information. So all I'm doing is rendering it, but like I could run any, like any song through here, right? Like, and it would also be the same. This is just like a different like flow visualization right now. And right now there's no interactivity like with mouse because it just hasn't been built in. Right now this is just like a pure, a pure audio input is creating like all the noise right here. Uh, and it's driving this whole like animation. I could also go around and like look at my render a bit more because like my camera's like pointed in to kind of show you more of what's going on. Hold on. Let me find my camera control. Yep, right here. So we can zoom out a little bit. You're gonna notice it gets really blurry again because I have that depth of field effect on. But like basically you just have this like large shape like in this environment that's like being mapped and then like the audio spectrum is like going around it. Yeah, you see it. And then it's just like flowing across the surface. So I'm just gonna control Z back real fast. Mm, not quite there. Cool, yeah, that's about it. Um, and again, that depth of field is enabled. Like I can turn it off, you know, like, like just bypass it. Hold on. Jump under two. What the hell? Not that one. It might be because I have this in the middle of on. Yeah, there he goes. All right. So like now, you know, it's like just a solid depth of field and I can just go look around it. Um, and it's just like, I hope this shows that like how like easily, and then like I can do like a different view because like I really just have a camera in 3D space, you know, that's like looking around this, you know, so you could switch between inputs. Yeah, it's like the, the visualization plugins, absolutely. You know, like, and it could be anything, right? Like I always like think of screensaver when I see stuff like this. But like, yeah, you can get like effects like this. And then you could create like camera states and like toggle between them as well. So like, this is an issue of like how you're using audio, you know, like to drive 
you know, like something inside of Fetch Designer. In this case, like a visualization. And my song ended, so I feel like that's a good time just to just to quit. So let me go ahead and kill my volume on this. All right, and I'll go ahead and turn off my desktop audio. Cool. But like you can see that this is like an example of driving something with uh, audio instead. And I just want to throw up some more examples because there's like a broad range of what you can do with this software. Um, and the other side is we can just mess with like shaders completely. Let's see. I'll need something plugged in to do this one though. Um, talking about audio reactive shaders, we could do this one. Let's see. Flex solver, mouse instancing. Uh, you can do stuff in real time. I just want to see. So I've got instancing. Instancing is really powerful inside of Touch Designer. I'm going to load another one, see if it lets me do it. Yeah, here we go. So this one I've got set up is just a this sculpture in here. And this is generative, like it could have been built out of anything. Um, hold up one sec. Where's that going? OK. Let me find my, yeah, I think it's this one. So all this is being driven by this noise node right here. And all it's doing is generating like noise that's just like a different kind of ones. And this is generating this 3D object. So like, let me mess with the seed real fast. So every time I change it, you get a new 3D object, right? Like, and like, this is like purely generative, purely procedural coding. Um, and it's just all based on this noise node. So what I can do with this is do some cool stuff. Let me see if I get the right one. So we can transform this noise. Because again, this is all written in Python. So I can just put in like a very simple Python script. Hold on. We'll do soup point five. That's a little fast. <laughs> Freaking out on me. Let's slow it down a little bit. Yeah, maybe more like that. Okay. So like at this time, now you've got this one that's morphing through different noise nodes, you know, like at the same time, because you're moving through the noise and it's translating. So what we have now is like this generative like fractal based sculpture, you know, that's basically purely created off this node that's like, you know, moving and rotating through space. Let me see. And then I came up with some cool stuff that you can do with it as well, like this limit. Hold on, let me see if I turn this on. Because it's like a clamp. Yeah, that's right. So like, you can like trap it inside the box, you know, like with, with your clamp functions. Like if you don't want it out, like you can limit even like so to the point where it just like goes like off into the distance, you know, so like it won't go beyond that value. Um, let me reset this parameter. What's other stuff like I was doing with it? Is it this limit? Yeah, this one's pretty cool. So then you're taking the noise and then you're restricting the pattern it goes into. So I don't know if you can see this in here, but we're putting like a real high threshold on it. That's kind of terrifying. I like it. I think it's pretty good. So like you can see that now it's generating these like um, clamped, like, you know, where they were very organic. Now it's these more like hard surface shapes, you know, that's generating inside of it. So like, and this is just like me, you know, playing with one value like on here. And you see like I can clamp it out completely. Like if I want to like limit it to a certain space. So like you can just do some really cool stuff like with like creating generative noise like inside of Touch Designer. And like this could be based on anything, right? So like I'm just gonna let that run for a second. Cool. Anything else I want to mess with in here? Not really. I just want to kind of show that you can like create this noise geometry. And how this works, I guess I should say as well, is that this is done through like a process called instancing. So basically we have a, in this case, a texture. It's this noise texture. And then we have a geometry, which in this case is filled with boxes. Um, let me grab my camera because we can get a little closer. Can get a little closer to the action. Oops. That's the opposite. Hold on. It's because I've got a look at constraint on. So like, let me get rid of my constraint and look at it real fast so we can just fly around it. So I've got this box right here and now we can just go in and look. And basically if you look close enough, that's all cubes, right? Like all that we're doing is like building up cubes and displacing them across space. So what we can do is this is through a process of called texture instancing where we have this geometry node. We go back to our instance and we'll see that we're driving all of this 
by this um, <laughs> by this POS. So it's short for position node. And basically, as this changes, um, it's updating the sequence in space because where these are located, um, where they're translated across, is based on the value RGB. So you know, wherever they're read, it's going to be in a certain coordinate point. So each one of these, um, it's a one to one. Like each pixel is a coordinate. And then the RGB is actually very easy to correspond and change. So like the RGB pixel value, that's three values um, between a certain predetermined spaces, can now be mapped to points in space. So rather than like, you know, just saying a color, it's like, okay, instead of being a color, this is now just a point in space that you're going to be created on. And then how big this is is just dependent on the resolution of this texture. So it's like 256. Well, I don't think it is actually. What's, the, what's my original noise input? So my original resolution is 600 by 600. So like if I change something here, I think it'll break it. No, nope, it'll just shrink it down. Cool. I'm glad it didn't break. So now I've, you can see I've dropped a lot of that space because, again, my original grid is only like this big. So basically the same size of resolution as every pixel uh, counts as a square, as a cube, like in this example. So by doing this, you can make really cool generative pieces you know, that are translating because the noise is also translating and moving. Um, and again, this is driven by noise, but you can also drive this input through any other way. Like I could like link up, like like I said, like a camera, and put it on here, and then um, use like the position of my hand in space in order to displace like these colors, and then like displace like the actual geometry on the screen. So real fast, let's look at another example, and then I might like jump into like some actual like teaching or like talking about how to use the software because I want to show you kind of an example of like how you can get to some of this stuff. Um, but I also, you know, like also want to show you like, you know, how much is going on here and like how cool like that you can do this. That's a feedback noise. Yeah, I think this one's good. Let's do something 2D. Let's get out of 3D for a second. Yep. All right, cool. So we've talked about feedback in the past. So this is a project that I've made that is purely two-dimensional uh, generative art. Like this can be um, mapped on anything. But like all this is right now is it's just a noise feedback loop that again is based on uh, noise displacement. So in this case, a ramp. And then you see that we have this noise, you know, that's kind of powering it. And then we have two separate feedback loops that you can mess with and change. So like, Right now, I've got it mapped to pink. I'm going to actually turn this off for a second. So we've got uh, this kind of basic ramp. And then I'm going to go back to my switch right here. Oops. Turn this back on. I'm going to reset it real fast. Hmm. Oh, sorry. I need to bypass the lookup. OK. So now we're here back without color. So this is purely generative. It's all doing doing it on the computer end. Um, this is a 2D image. It's not 3D. Uh, but it kind of gives you an idea of like the textures and stuff you can create within it. So you've got this cool cloth-like effect. I'm going to reset it real fast so you can see what that looks like. And you'll see that it's building up really slowly. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. Um, and I've also built in the switch on here that you can change the color on. So like if you want to, you know, displace rather black rather than white, you can start layering it up, you know, so we can go there. Oh, thanks, Claire. Yeah, so like, so I can move it back. And this is being driven by noise, but it could be driven by lots of things. I think that's like, I guess that's the point I want to make, like, uh, like going from this is just how many things that you can drive it with. Um, so like in this case, like I just have a noise going through here. So you see that the variation, this edge between the red and the black, is where this feedback is generating. And then like if I want to change it, you know, like I can change it back to black, you know, and create like a new, like kind of build the art as I go, like with my input. And like the switch could be controlled by anything, right? Like if you wanted to make this interactive and like give people like a chance to like draw and create with it, like you could give them the control to toggle the switch, you know, like and then all of a sudden they're putting their input in, you know, to create the stuff. Um, real fast. Like I said, I'm drying this off noise, but you could do it with anything. After a while, it will slow down um, just because it's created on the border between these, and eventually one will overtake the other. But you can always start again. Whoops. You can always start again, like here. Like, I'm just going to run it. Let me switch it back to white. Since we have a black background, it doesn't work. Black on black doesn't look that good. But I can switch it here, and then I can do a switch. 
and switch and switch and switch and you can see like I can continuously like you know kind of change where the white and the black like interact with each other and go through and all this is being done is just a feedback loop like it's um it's a very pretty feedback loop but like it just gives you an idea of like the 2d textures you can make yeah and I think it looks beautiful it's not like an original creation um this was kind of off of a tutorial but you can apply that same kind of effect you know to anything that you make so that's kind of an example of a 2d aspect um let me see if I have anything that's like funnier and like less beautiful I think I've got one It'll take me a second to fix this, but it will be funny. So give me give me one second. So I built this using um, some of the OpenGL shaders that you have that like allow you to like you know you can code the shaders like in C like through the OpenGL language. Um, and we do a little bit of that in this one. Again, it's another tutorial. Like I said, I feel like I'm. Um, still learning touch designer like in that way but I really just want to kind of showcase it like in some of the stuff that you can do with it ah, I think I might need to kill it and bring it back up one second let me close this and I'm just opening up that new file but I like I don't know it's like when it, people like ask me like what touch designer is it's it's hard to describe because you can do so much with it like and you can use it as a tool you can use like as much as you want with it you can use as little as you want with it but basically, in this way, you're using generative coding nodes, you know, in combination with each other to create something that's like a bigger part than its whole. So let me go through, and I want to bring up. I think this is an old project. Yeah, drawing. This one's good. Let's try one more time. Do the double drawing. There we go. Okay. So I'll need to change this video device in. Let's see. I think I'm going to use a depth camera. Give me one second to hook it up. Uh, it's it's a complicated process um, using multiple cameras when you're streaming and trying to use them for interactivity because you have to you know use only one input at a time. But I want to see right here. So I'm just going to plug in my depth camera. We're only going to use it as a webcam for this example, but I just want to kind of show you because this is a this is a pretty cool pretty cool experiment. All right. So I've got my webcam plugged in. I'm going to put it off to the side here. I just need to change the device I'm using into a real sense depth RGB. Oh, amazing. I love it. Okay, let's turn this off. Spoiler alert. Okay, cool. So you're gonna see me kind of in two in two regards right now. So here I am. Hello. You've got me on my camera in Touch Designer, which is right there, and then you've got my webcam, which is right here. So we're on the Touch Designer camera for right now. So what I can do here is I've just made a feedback loop, and all this does. Um, here's the code. We can blow it up. All this does is it's basically grabbing. Um, high like high saturation values and then overriding them with lower saturation ones so I'm like curious how this is going to work with the green screen in the background um, but we've got a lot of white space around me to do it so give me a second um, so here's the code block for this and again you're using this GSL GLSL shader GLSL shader and all this is doing is working on this code so I'm going to turn on the feedback real fast I'm going to kind of show you what it does um, and I can tell you why I did this in a second. So we're going to turn this on. All right, so right now I'm not moving. And then if I just fade away, basically, yeah, because the green is so saturated, like I can't override it, right? But I can draw with my hands, like back here in the background. And then if I pulse this, it just goes back to normal and I can do it again. So basically I'm glitching it out. And if I had a high contrast item, let me see. Yeah, here we go. High saturation. Now it's terrifying. Yeah, it's pretty scary. Um, so we've got this notepad right here, right? Let me see. So I can actually draw with this on my screen space in the feedback loop. And I could clean this up with like putting some blur and stuff in here. But like you see, I can draw across my webcam. And then, yeah, so it's a little more, it's a little more saturated in parts than the green screen. But the green screen's breaking in a little bit um, just because it's so saturated. Like normally, um, 
like no normally like in place like you wouldn't be able like there's normally not like a big green wall behind you so it, since it has a high saturation value i can't um override that but because you know i've got all this white and brown background behind me they're relatively low saturation uh, i actually made this because um you can take a uh, spout which i've kind of already talked about and you can use a program called spout cam uh, and then you can map your uh, touch designer feed directly into Zoom or directly into whatever thing that uses a webcam. And so in the middle of a Zoom meeting, like I could just like toggle it on, you know, and be like, oh, I, th I think like my feed's glitching out, you know, like, and then just like, you know, exit the meeting, right? Uh, because like, you know, because it looks, it looks like everything is just breaking on my end. But really all I'm doing is just running this simple touch, de touch designer uh, GLSL shader script. So like, uh, so just like just to show like some like the things you can do with Touch Designer like I mean I feel like I'm not even qualified like to talk about like everything but I just want to like you know kind of showcase the merits of like what you can do yeah I'm out by Zoom you know like no more meeting like sorry I don't know what's going on guys like something's up with my camera um but basically like uh all this stuff that you can do like there's just so many applications for like what you can do inside of Touch Designer and like and I haven't even touched like a lot of it. Um, so I think I want to show you like kind of what the building blocks of Touch Designer are and like go into some operators because um, they're pretty important like for any time that you start Touch Designer. I have more projects and like more inputs that I can show, but like I just want to start right here to kind of show you because we have to talk about like how you do make stuff in it at some point. Like I can't just show you like cool projects. So we'll just start, start a new scene. So we'll just quit. All right, I'm just loading it in. Yeah, isn't an after hour stream. Yeah, it's pretty trippy. All right, cool. So if you come into Touch Designer, you're gonna be faced with this big blank canvas. And basically your tools of the trade is if you hit tab on your keyboard, you're gonna open all these nodes. And if you've ever worked in like a node based framework before, you're gonna know that like you just have a bunch of nodes like and combining them and how you combine them is like how you're gonna make anything out of it. So there, by default, there's one, two, three, four, five, yeah, six. There's pretty much five types of main nodes and they're up here at the top. Tops, chops, sops, mats, and dats. So you can't see, oh, weird, hold on. No, you can't, that's really bizarre. Okay, so it's not coming up here. I did open the notes. So what it does is it pops out a window. I think what it's doing, let me, let me do a quick little hack real fast. I'm just gonna hack my uh, OBS feed real fast. Bear with me for one second. So we're gonna do a window capture instead. Yeah, it's a separate window. It's a, it's a separate window pop-up. That's why you can't see it. So rather than this, okay, I'm just gonna do a display capture instead of a, an app capture. Yeah, display capture, yeah. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm just setting one up. Ooh, that looks good, okay. And then not this display capture. We'll move it down here. Bear with me one second, you guys. I just want you to see this, so. There we go. Okay, so we will adjust this. Love it, do it on the fly. Hey, look at that, you can see the nodes now. All right, so thank you for bearing with me. Uh, I knew how to fix it, just had to go in and do it. So we've got it. All right, so right here, this is your node palette. And then on here, you've got your tops, chops, sops, mats, and dats. Uh, basically, all these stand for is the first letter is all that matters. Texture operators, channel operators, um, solid operators, I think, or shape operators, um, materials, and then data is basically what you're working with. Uh, so in this case, like if I've got my tops, anything that is in tops is going to deal with flat 2D textures. So if I'm generating, like you saw a lot of my stuff is noise based, like this is where I'm going to get my noise nodes, like right and stuff like this. So if you're working with procedural coding, noise is pretty important. 
um, because it forms like the basis for how you get you know your random and computer based you know like movement and change and variation and stuff here. So you can also bring in any kind of file that you want, either texture, like here's my banana texture, um, like either a movie file or a still image. In this case, it's an image. And then like you can do all kinds of funky stuff. So I can like throw in a displace node and I can bring my banana and I can displace it by the noise and all of a sudden my banana has been, you know, thrown to the Cosmos, right? Like, um, and then you can change the offset of that or like the displace weight, you know, so if I want to make it, you know, not as displaced or not as strong, like I can scale that way down and now I have like a less exploded banana. And then like, I think the other thing that's important to note is that like, and I can, and if you haven't been picking up on this is like, I can drive these, um, I can drive these by anything like at any point and it doesn't like even matter. So like I have this um, displace weight, you know, like right here. So like what I could do is just drive this by my mouse, you know, X and Y function right here. So like if I just take this and I'm like, let's say we'll just do my mouse Y and then we'll just export it and my mouse Y and we'll just export it. And then you'll see as I move my mouse up and down, like I'm destroying the banana, like and ripping it apart, right? So like, you know, interactively real time, we'll make it a little bigger. And like, it could be anything, right? Like, and anything can be driven by this. Like this is just an example. Um, like you're gonna hear me saying that a lot. It could be anything, but it's true. Like you can drive any kind of um, change across any node, like interactively as you go. But basically this is just to say that texture operators, yeah, we broke it, I'm sorry. We can take off a reference. And like I said, this is just a Python reference right here. So you're using your operator mouse in one, your mouse input, and you're taking the TY channel of that operator. If you're thinking about it, like from a coding perspective. Um, and there's just a lot of referencing, and like I said, and then you can reference that kind of stuff like with um, other things as well. So right here, so your texture operators is how, what deals in here, we can just do it. You could also take this and animate it. You know, you can take your noise. Um, you'll see me do this all the time. ABS time dot seconds times 0.1. Um, and now your banana is being displaced along with the noise that's animating. You know, you go through, you could drive the animation of that noise through any input. So like you can just do like anything, you know, basically with this, like to mess with it. So this is basically just with the 2D operators though. So I'm going to get rid of them because uh, we're going to talk about other operators, but just know that the tops are where everything 2D lives. Your chops are your channel inputs. So most of your audio stuff is going to live here. Um, you see you have lots of audio play options, audio sequencing, um, pattern creators, you know, like you can just like do noise, but now it's like a null channel, you know, within here. Um, let's see. Noise, just think about it, X, Y, Z. We're going along the X axis. Okay, so we'll do ABS time. We'll do dot frame um, times maybe five. Yeah, there you go. So now I can create just like this like a uh, variable noise function in my audio and I can use it to drive anything. Um, so like, I don't even know, like, like let's drive something else. So like we could drive like a sphere, right? And like, let's put it the transform. So now we have the sphere with a transform node and we have this channel that, you know, that's going up and down. So what we could do is take this transform of here, this channel, and we could throw it in the translation of the Y value on the sphere. So I can just grab this, whoop, I lost it. <laughs> Hold on, sorry, one second. Just going to frame. Help me get back. Uh, anyway. So we know it's in there somewhere and I don't need this because again, you can just use the Python reference. Like all I was doing was dragging it, but I know that, um, that the operator was string noise one and that the channel was chan one. Also a string though, so put it in your quotes. All right, let's see if I can code. Oh look, and there you go. So like, so basically I've taken this, you know, just this sine noise wave and I'm using it to drive this. And I could go a step beyond this too. So like I can go take a math node and you'll find that you use this a lot as you code. 
So I can take this math node and I can mess with the range. So right now it's going on a range of plus and minus one, basically, negative 0.5 to 0.5. But I could take that from range zero to one and go range, I don't know, zero to two. And all of a sudden I've amplified that times two. So I can take this and instead of op noise one, I can say op math one. And all of a sudden that's bigger, it's more displaced. And I could go even more. I could go 0.4, you know, I could go 10. You know, like those moving up and down. And basically you can just like kind of go forever, like with what you're creating. So like because I've used the channel operation of that, like to displace it, you know, you're getting a seizure right now. So let me, let me turn it back down. So back to point one. Um, so you can see that. And then I could take this and I could render this, right? Like, I'm just trying to give you like examples. So like, so this is a little more complex, but if you, you can take any geometry and you can render it out as a texture, right? Like you can just render it like you would in the game engine. So if I'm doing that though, I'll need a geometry. One sec, hold up. We're just gonna link it from here. geometry. So there it is, you know, doing its jump up and down thing. And then I'm going to need a camera to watch it. So, and then I'm going to need a light because you need a light, you know, light your scene. And then the last thing I need is a render. So now here it is, you know, like here's my thing, my scene all rendered out, you know, as a big ball. Uh, very alarmingly, I guess I would say. So now I can take this you know, I've made this and I can make a feedback loop out of it. So remember before when I saw like the very pretty like noise, like that was just a um, feedback that was being generated out of it. So I could take this and I could put the feedback into a comp. Sorry, one sec. And com all comp is is your compositing. So, you know, like in Photoshop, you have your like multiply screen overlay options. That's what a composite is doing. I can take this feedback and I can put it in it. Right now we have a multiply. Let me uh, turn off the render and we'll go to the composite. So because the multiply is on, it looks very strange. But we could do a top or over, I think is the one I like doing. And you see that now it's like writing it on top. And I can take this feedback and I can say the target top is comp1. And you'll see now that wherever the sphere goes, it's writing like the position of the camera frame on top of it. So it's like continuously like building it up forever. And then I can mess with the feedback loop, you know, like I could say insert operator, maybe level, you know, something like this. And then we could, uh, you know, turn the brightness up and all of a sudden, like when I have the one, you'll have to pulse it to see the real effect. But you know, like now as I pulse it, like everything in the background is getting really bright. I could go into post and I could turn the opacity down and now, rather than like having that there forever, can you make the ball, oh, sorry. I can slow this down, I'm sorry. Real fast, let's just turn that off, yeah. So, yeah, you get into some alarming stuff in here. But yeah, you can just do this, it's just in your noise node. So like, if we wanna move it slower, that's more jittery, hold on. So, move it slower, turn the period down, or turn it up, I guess I should say. And now it's just going to move slower. The trail is really cool, cool. Yep, no problem. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, check out Touch Designer. Like, it's really cool. Like, I just want, this is just like a base level stuff. So, you know, like, now I have my feedback, my brightness, you know, and I can leave this behind. Let me just run this down a little bit. And then we could also translate it, right? Like, it doesn't have to be here. Hold on. Sorry, transform. Translates only for subs. So we could transform it. We could say, I don't know, maybe 0.1. That might be a little strong. Maybe we can scale it down. 0.01. Yeah, there we go. And then we could also turn this back up because we got the post production on something like this run it through. Yeah, thanks for stopping by and checking it out. And then now we have this, you know, instead, and it's just being run on top of it. And this was pretty fast and simple, right? Like, I mean, like, it's very quick to get this kind of stuff set up. Um, 
Do to do. Uh oh. Gotcha, gotcha. Alright, cool. <laughs> I saw the bot come up, and for a second I thought it was like, you know, uh, a bad bot. But no, it's just one of ours. But you can use this to run this. Like, so I guess like basically what I'm showing is just like, there's a lot you can do inside of Touch Designer. Um, like just to make art, and like this is like a small portion of it, right? Um, but basically all I was showing is that channel operators basically just provide information or animation in, in this kind of sequence. Um, that's actually where this whole rabbit hole started, is we just wanted to talk about channel operators. And there's a lot you can do with them. Like we already said math, you know, like you can change the range on this, like what we did, like I ordered it zero to one. You can go zero to three. You can reorder stuff. Um, Go through like combine different channels like and stuff through that. I uh, just want to see other stuff that we can do. Yeah, you can analyze. I love the analyze node, and we'll just basically put in everything that you're doing and show you, like as a reaction. So I can like pull the info and like see everything you know from the cook frame to like the difference in the min max on here. So if you ever want to like look into your code, you can. Um, different things that you can do in the channels. Anything with this audio, so you can do like uh, like kick trackers, you can do um, like different like uh, oscillations like within it, you can get different patterns. Let me see if I've got one here. Sorry, I'm not as familiar with the, um, yeah, patterns, basically. I'm not as familiar with these because I'm not an audio person, but that's no excuse because they're super useful for anything. So you've got different patterns. So you can do sine waves, cosine waves, you know, like your triangle ones, ramp. So basically anything you can do like with an oscillator, you can do um, like inside of Touch Designer as well. So, you know, like your pulses and stuff, like you can mess with them and set them up. So like basically you can use Touch Designer like a th synthesizer, right? Basically like that's what you can do and you can create stuff and, you know, mess with audio tracks inside of here. I wish I could elaborate more on it because like there's so many cool things you can do with audio inside of Touch Designer. And it also has a native Ableton link. So like right in here, um, I'm not using it now because I don't use Ableton too much, but you can port your music and your channels uh, directly from Ableton into Touch Designer, like in real time. Like I know lots of people who do like interactive like music tracks, like they're DJing and then like they've got their VJ stuff like synced into Touch Designer simultaneously. Like because you have this like Ableton link on here. Oh, you lost me, but that's okay. <laughs> I was just like looking like. Here, okay, I'm back. Uh, so you can use Ableton as a bridge within Touch Designer. You can use a MIDI controller, you know, as a bridge from whatever you're using into Touch Designer. Um, and it's all through this channel track right here. You have a MIDI in, you know, like a MIDI in port right here that you can bring in your MIDI device, you know, like inside of Touch Designer. You can bring in your MIDI mapper. Yeah, MIDI in map. So you can map all the controls in your MIDI device into different just nodes on here, in different parameters, and you can control like the entire like this you know showcase of what you're making with just a MIDI controller. So like it's highly interactive. Um, you have so many functions that you can control in real time. Um, and I just kind of want to show that like from a channel position. Uh, SOPs. Let's just clear all this out. Like get rid of this. Okay. So SOPs are your shape operators. So basically, this is where your 3D stuff lives. Um, and Touch Designer does have a 3D engine. So on here, I just want to show, you've got your various ones, you've got like cubes, your boxes, your primitives, you know, stuff like that. But you can also do a lot with it. And a lot of what Touch Designer, let's go back in, excels at is using your, um, using your shapes and shape operators to instance them, like and create instance geometry. So let me go back in. Yeah, I keep zooming out. I'm not that far away. OK. Basically, the file structure in Touch Designer works that it's like a nested node-based system. So like I've got this project node. And basically, I can go inside of it. And then this is where my like you know one lives. And I could like nest things even further. Because I have all these comp op operators, too. So like I could use like a container, uh, like a container panel. And I can basically just stick stuff in it. Right, so copy into container one, and then I go in there, and then like I've just got a new file structure, right? Like just like inside of that. So now I can just nest things in, and if I want to do like an output, so let's like let's say I've got this cube, and I can do just an out node, right? Like off of it, and then if I zoom out, all of a sudden my container's got an output. 
So you can just like nest things in and create your own functions like through inside of it. And then you can just save these containers and like paste them into like new projects, right? Like you just grab all your nodes. Like it's crazy how customizable Touch Designer is and like how much stuff you can make with it. So I'm gonna just go out real fast. Anyway, back, back to talking about shapes. A lot of the strength of Touch Designer, um, let's see, maybe a sphere, comes from something called instancy. So um, let's just take a sphere right here, and I'm going to put a couple nodes on it, maybe a transform. And then we need a geometry for it. If you're uh, trying to put geometry in, make sure you spell it right. Geo. Oh, sorry. It's also not in the SOP. It's in the comp. Geometry. So you can put like this geometry into it, and this gives us some options. So we have these instancing options, which we can turn on or off. So like what instancing does, I think we can just go ahead and cut it on. This is a very basic instance, but it will give you a good idea. So we have this sphere. It has a bunch of points on it. So there's the wireframe for the sphere up in the corner. And then what I can do is I can take this, turn on instancing, say my default instance OP is box one. And then I can translate points based on the points here. I think I have this backwards, actually. I think I should have referenced uh, the box geometry. One second. Let me put this in here as geometry. I'm just going to break this link. Disconnect. Throw that in there. I'm going to say my default instance operator is sphere one. And then we'll use the points. Yeah, this looks better. Yeah, there we go. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> then I need to see what I'm looking at. So I like a camera and a light. This is your basic uh, 3D setup right here. And we'll render it out. Okay. Then we can take a look at what we've what we've created. So you see now. Basically what we're doing is that all these boxes have been applied to points on the surface of the sphere and we're instancing them in real time. So what we can do, let me just make this box a bit smaller. I'm just doing, we want to put a transform on here. So I can set the scale down, something like this, and you'll notice that we have this full, you know, box like that's created and it's using the points on the sphere. So now I have this like mesh of boxes. Let me let me get this on screen a little better. And I guess you can kind of see how instancing works. You know like in this case, like you've basically taken the sphere and then every single point on the sphere. So all these points on here. Do, 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 display options, turn on the points. All these points have now been replaced with a sphere. So like you no longer have the original uh, sphere you just have the points that are serving as a map for where to put all these other objects and they don't have to be boxes right like they can be anything i feel like I, I feel like that's what i say like in touch in this touch designer stream like that should be um yeah we can unlock that should be like the the slogan of this stream is like it doesn't have to be this like it can be anything but it's really true like you can map anything with anything in touch designer so like if i didn't want this box right i could just delete it and i could put another sphere And then all of a sudden we have a sphere made of spheres, you know, like on here. Yeah, the possibilities. No, it's true. Like that's that's what I what I talk about. And I don't know. Maybe it, like it doesn't make as much sense. Like you know, to other people they're like it's like Ian. This software is not this cool. But like I think it's super cool. Just there's so much you can do with it. And then I could take this. So we've got this instance, and I could apply a noise to it. So we've got this noise right here. So we could do this noise in a couple ways. We could apply it to the sphere. Hmm, disappeared. What's giving me my, my error? Not enough sources specified. Oh, yeah. It's because I'm doing it in the wrong order. Noise goes on this side. There you go. <laughs> okay. Get different seeds. I just want to check my view. 
quick dependency, exports or expressions or wiring that are created in this loop. Gotcha. Yes. And the issue is I should not be referencing the sphere one. I should be referencing transform one. Okay, and the noise. I actually should be referencing a null, is what really should be happening. Remember, before you create connections, make a null. All right, so now we have this null. I'm gonna delete that real fast. Okay. A certain operator, I'll say noise. Yep, there we go. That's what I wanted to see. All right, so now, yeah, it can be anything. Yeah, someone needs to make a supercut of this stream afterwards. So now what I've basically done is I've taken this sphere and I've applied noise to it, so it's being uh, distorted in real time. And then what that does is it applies to my render. And all of a sudden, now all the instance spheres are also being distorted because the shape underneath them is moving. Uh, and then at the same time, you know, like I could scale the spheres up. I have these transform options, so I could like increase the uniform scale, make sort of some kind of like meta blob, meta blob or something like that. I can decrease it, you know, it doesn't have to be this. Point oh five, maybe, you know, like something like that. Like, cause like all this, is, and this, all, this is also saying, this is all being done in real time. Like it's all being rendered real time. Um, I could, I might break things again, but we'll give it a shot. I could insert an operator. I could use, where is it? Give me one second. Oh yeah, I could do sprinkle. <laughs> yeah, I thought that might break everything. That's fine if it did. Gotcha, gotcha. And eh, we'll leave it off for right now. But like I could increase like the number of points and just like make new ones, right? Like um, so like you don't have like that many, like there's like not really limits to like what you want to do. Again, I could take this, you know, feedback and make another feedback loop because that's all I like to do is make feedback loops. You know, on top of it, do another another nifty operation. Let's say over. Pipe that into itself. Like this. On target top is comp one. Oops. What am I rendering? Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry, one second. I'm just doing the thing. And then I think instead of over, not add. No, this looks too nice. What's going on? From the render feedback's going in, it's referenced to comp one. They're both on here. Let me pull that. There we go. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. All right, awesome. <laughs> Cozy. All right, so now you know we're creating the same one as before, uh, except it just is overriding itself. If we switch the order, it will continue to write on top of itself and have all the stuff in the background. Uh, but if you put it on top. He goes behind it, so you can mess with that and make this, you know. Uh, also, again, just stick in more stuff. Put in your level. Post. If you don't want it, if you want it to eventually go away, you can turn down your opacity. You can run it like that. Say like 0.99 or something. And then it will eventually fade away, although it'll take a long time. Uh, but you can do a lot. That's all. That's all I will say. Um, so you can run that kind of stuff as well. And then we'll just get rid of this because we don't need a feedback loop. Not everything needs to be a feedback loop. Uh, and then we'll go from there. All right. So I can run this and then use this as uh, an exhibit as well. And like again, it doesn't have to be a sphere. Like we could get rid of the sphere and uh, do a box. And not just any box. We could make it a really tall box, <laughs> like this, or like that. You know, like it doesn't matter, right? Like you could use anything. So 
So like that's kind of the the strength of instancing. It could be like scans of my head, you know, as long as the the shader can support it. Like as long as your um not the shader, sorry, as long as your GPU can support it. So basically, you just want to like start out with stuff like this, and then this is your um, shape operators. So if you want to do anything in 3D, you can do it here. Can we sync the sphere, but to the audio from earlier? Yeah, I think we can. Um, give me a second to do this. All right, so first things first, we're going to leave this on here. And we're going to bring in a ch uh, an audio track. So let's say audio file in, because we need our audio first. So I'm just thinking about how to build it. And then we need to grab our audio file. So we got some audio samples. That's not what I want. Let's take it from earlier. We could grab one of these, but I don't know what's on them. So we'll just stick with these for a second. So touch designer, old projects, little story. Okay. And then I'm going to. Oh, I don't think it's audio file. I think that's going to ruin it. I think it's audio device. Yeah. Audio device in. Okay. Oh, no, it is audio file. Sorry. Let me just bring it back then. So, little story. Got it in here. We've got audio play. This is more for me, just so I can make sure I can hear it. Light wall on. Reload. Okay, so we've got our audio tracks. Um, they're not synced up right now, but what we want to do from here, I think we want to merge them. So then we just get one. Or, sorry, no, select. We'll just select one for now. Uh, it looks like it's in stereo, but it looks like the, the sequences aren't that different. So I'm just going to select one channel, and I'm just going to grab channel one. Oops. Sorry, this is from here. So the chop is audio play one. So we're going to put that in. Audio play one. And our channel name is going to be channel one. All right, so now we just have the one. We've separated it out. So now we can use this to displace. So we want to take a math. I'm already positive that we'll need a math in here. And then we need to pick an axis. So we've got our noise that we could do from here. And we have this transform node. So right now, it's kind of going crazy on the Z. But we can always change it on a different axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale the X and the Y simultaneously like um, through it as well and see what we get. What we'll probably also need is we'll probably need a lag. Yeah, because what happens is that this is too crazy, right? Like this is too much noise, like all at once. You know, you see that? So what a lag is going to do is it's basically going to take that channel and it's going to sample it like every like 0.2 seconds or something like that. So like we've got a small amount of noise here as opposed to this. And we'll compare them in a second to show how crazy that would have been uh, if we left it on there. But we'll do a lag. And we can even make it longer if we need. We could do like a 0.5 second lag. If you go too long though, it gets weird. So like, yeah, like that's pretty, pretty low. So we'll go back to 0.2 and we can play with it a little bit if we want. So we've got this lag of 0.2 seconds on the channel. So then we're going to go in and we're going to put a null in here. And this is best practiced. Um, basically a null is just an empty node that goes uh, into something because you can make changes behind it, right? So like now if I need to like insert something right here or like add another thing down the line, like I have this empty node that's referenced. Um, so I don't like have to relink everything. All right, so we've got this channel. Um, it's way too low right now. If you look at like the things it's like we're like 0 0.0000 to like 0 0.002. So this is what the math is for. Um, in fact, actually, I actually don't think we need a math here. I think we need a math here, right before our null. So we're going to put a math in. And then we're going to change this range. So right now, looks like we're going 0 0.005. That's kind of our max. So 0 from 0 0.005 to 0 to 1. So now we've taken that and we've gone from 0 0 0.005 to 0 to 1, because the math has remapped that range. All right. So now I'm going to bring this over here. So now I think we have a usable channel we can use to displace it. So we're going to bring this over here. 
and now we can use this audio track to displace this noise. So I'm just gonna see what this looks like. It might actually be really weird. I'm not sure the noise is the best place to displace it, but like, it might be the transform. Let's try the transform first. So we're gonna hook this up to the scale, is basically, like the X and Y scale. So I'm gonna grab this, and I'm gonna basically just drag this channel in here. And you can do this a number of ways. You can just drag and drop, or you can reference it using uh, Python. I'm gonna drag and drop for now just to see what we get. So we'll grab the scale. Oh, whoops. Yeah, I was having this issue last time too, like I couldn't grab it, hold on. I think it's because, is it select or, or constant? I think it might be constant, hold on. No, that's not it, okay. Well, I'm just gonna reference the channel. Usually you should just be able to drag and drop it in. Um, I'm not sure why it's not working on this one. Oh, it's because I just, I don't need the viewer. So I can drag the scale. No, it's not dragging the channel. Okay, I'm just gonna reference it. Uh, I don't wanna reference it because like it's easier, but you can just type it out. So X and Y, so basically if you're using Python, you need to call the operator, which in this case is operator null to. And the name is a string, so make sure you put it in uh, parentheses. And then you need to reference the channel, which again, a string is channel one. You could also put zero in here because there's only one channel and um, computer counts you know, from zero up upwards. So we could say this as well and it should reference it. So I'm gonna hit enter. That's a little extreme. Oh boy, <laughs> um, let's turn it down. So I'm gonna kill this so we don't get a seizure. Okay, and then I'm gonna take this and it's a little big still. You notice that? So we can just take our math node and we can just take it to, I don't know, like let's say 0 0.05. A little flat at the moment still. It might be there's just too much variation in between it. Let's just see. Or we might just need to turn up our lag a little bit. I'm gonna do that and try that for a second. So let's turn our lag up. Yeah, that looks a little better. Let's go a little higher. We just need to calm these channels down, right? Because like right now it's like a true like approximation of like everything. So you kind of have this kick feature. All right, and it also looks like a pancake. And the reason for that is because um, we need to scale both of them by it. So what I can do is take this transform and I can just copy and paste it into the Y as well. Yeah, in fact, I think it does need to be big, but like it needs to be like, so like, let's scale this up. Yeah, cool. So now I think this isn't seizure inducing enough and we can put it in. So now there's a, still a noise on it, but you see that now it's like, it's like, oof. So now it's like synced up to that. We can also slow it down even more or interpolate it. So like, give me a second. So like, that's just the channel data, right? Um, we could, hold on. We could interpolate this data too. I just wanna see. So let's slow this lag down. It might be we need a lag on this side of the math. Let me just switch it. A lot of times your order, man, don't look at that, holy crap. Um, let me just switch this order up a little bit. I'm gonna turn this lag up. Hmm, interesting. One second, and then I wanna clamp acceleration real fast. Interesting, that's really cool. So now it's like the values are like way too big. Yeah, they're like 53. All right, so let's bring this math down because now we're like going from like one to 100. Sorry, I'm just like experimenting right here and like seeing. Interesting. So now you're like interpolating between like this gigantic like transform cloud. And right now just the scale is just way too big, right? So we just need to turn it back down. 
So just keep using this math. Let's go. Let's go up a little more. Let's say from range zero to five hundred. It goes down to zero to one. Yeah, it's just the channel's really big. This is is cool doing this on the fly. Okay, we're dropping it. Here we go. Coming back down a little bit. Still big. I'm just remapping this, adding another decimal point. All right, wow, that's really weird. I was just like looking and seeing. It also might be because we have this noise node. Like, let's just override the noise node real fast. Get everything coming back. Hmm, interesting. I think it's because there's so much longer between the lag at this point. I just want to see. So yeah, so the math is basically dead at this point. Like it's too low, right? So let's turn it back down. So pros and cons. Yeah, from all real-time rendering. Yeah, it's true. Like because you get to see everything, right? Like so, I just want to bring this up a little bit. So let's bring this up. So we're gonna grow this. Just a little low. What is this at? 0.05. Okay, yeah, it's just kind of growing. I'm gonna take out this interpolate node. So this lag is probably set too high. It's also probably part of it. I've also clamped it. Yep. <laughs> Don't like that. <laughs> Yeah, that seems more like in line with what I was thinking. Interesting. Okay, so our math needs to be adjusted. Okay, cool. So we're moving from point two. So we're going to say from range zero point four. to zero to one. Ugh. I'm just trying not to give us a seizure here. So there's another function that you can use to slow this down. And that's like basically what we're running into right now is that like it is like, you know, corresponding with the channel, but the channel is just too wild, right? Like at this speed. So like basically we just need to slow it down and only sample it like occasionally. Um, or at least for the purposes of animation. Forget. I don't think it was speed, but basically you can use a node in here to put it in. You can use lag to do it, but today like just lag's not working super well for me. Like amplitude. Yeah, that's not bad. It's also like Keep moving the math farther down, but like I want to. Okay, so the range, we'll say from point zero five, yeah, from zero to one, and you can kind of see like you know it displacing in the x and the y, and then you can also sync it to the z. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. If you want, since we're no longer running the noise through that. And you see that it's pushing it like all along, like the same way in the sign channel. But basically you'd want to slow it down. And then the song just ended. So like you can generate it that way. Yeah. So not like the best like example. Um, really we need some interpolation like between these states and we need to sample less often. Let me see. I'm just messing with this overshoot real fast. Woo, a little big. Point oh one. Yeah, so now you have like a small overshoot to everything, you know, that's working reactively. And then the lag is a little more lagged at this point. So we can also go down. 
I don't want to go too small. But then like, so now like the radius of the sphere is just reactive like based on the channel that you're using. You know, so you could also run that. Um, and if you wanted to run the noise, like you could plug the noise back in. Let me, let me do a little zoom out on my camera here. This is more along the lines of like what I would think it would look like. Yeah, so like, so now, you know, like you've still got your noise like shifting. Um, at this point, it might be good to turn it back into like a traditional box, just to show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like this. And then, but basically like at the same time while it's shifting, it's also um, being displaced by the audio like soundtrack as you've got. And you don't have to displace it like, you know, in the X and the Y. But like, you know, you can and then like zoom in a little bit with the camera. So that's kind of like talking about like how you can, you know, use shape, you know, functions to create this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> at least make us like stop watching that. So um, what you can also do is you can also use dat functions. Uh, the material is like fine, you're, with the material you're basically just um, shading like the 3D objects that you create, so it's not that important for this talk. But you also have dats, um, and dats are really super cool, and I wish I like could have messed with them more, but I haven't at this point. But basically um, what a dat does is just let you give like a table. So like at the most basic, you know, you can just use like a text dat and then you basically just have a text edit editor inside of, you know, Touch Designer. <laughs> that's funny. It opens into Notepad because apparently that's the dedicated text editor on this computer. So, uh, yeah. Uh, environment of Champions right here. But you can basically, you know, write your Touch Designer code, like, inside of here. So you could, like, put in, like, functions and stuff, and then, like, basically you can save it. See, because it asked me to save, and it would put it into this text editor. And you can also just write it inside of here too. So you could say like, you know, like reference like the null from earlier, you know, and then like pick out a channel and stuff and like do things to it with Python code, um, like with Python scripting, you know, inside of here. Uh, and you can also pull in like spreadsheets, like from here. So like if you want to store like a bunch of stuff into a table function, you can do it inside of here in Touch Designer. Yeah, we love Notepad. Yep, yep. So it's the, uh, it's the layman's uh, development environment, right? So you can like do that inside of here. And like, there's a lot of really crazy things you can do with tech stats. Um, unfortunately, I just don't have a good example right now and I wish I did, but like, yeah, like all the functionality and stuff and you can just like, you know, reference like all this file structure. You can pull CSV files in here and use the data to drive like all this. Um, it's just super cool. Um, let me see if I have an example that uses a good file dat. So I'm just gonna open a new project. To look through real fast. These are my old projects. Okay. Distance sensor, no. Drawing infinite space, instancing. Is there anything in here? No, not really. I'm just going to go back into my touch designer folder. Oh, also, there's something I meant to talk about on here, but I haven't really gotten the chance to yet. And that's like using um, other channel inputs, you know, like inside of Touch Designer. So real fast before we go, because I feel like I can't believe it, but we're already coming up on time. Give me one second. Ugh. I'm going to show like some things you can do with, you know, like different channel inputs inside Touch Designer. So we'll leave this up for right now. It's not like my like my favorite thing we've done. I feel like it needs a little bit of work, but it is it is interesting and cool. Um, so what I've got right now is a leap motion controller that like I've already set up. This is basically a hand tracking sensor that we have for checkout in the library. Like if you want to check one out, I'm gonna basically plug this into a computer, uh, and then I'm gonna kind of show you how we can use sensor data to drive these operations. Because I keep talking about it, but like I haven't really showcased it. So in this case, let me just go ahead and plug this in. So it's come up. And just like we have audio reactive stuff right now, I can go grab a, uh, another chop. 
for Leap Motion. It's got built-in native support, um, as it does to lots of stuff on here. And you see that I've got this big drop-down with lots of channels, where it's just basically um, just throwing these all in here. So if I put my hand over it, suddenly, I don't know if you can see this, if I put my hand over it, suddenly you can see that all of these are interacting and they're channels that I can use and reference um, to work with. So basically what I'm gonna look at right now are the, if you see right here, the palm uh, X, Y, and Z. So basically if you look at that, like as I move my hand forwards and backwards, you, you can see on the Z axis, let me pull it down, right there, there's the Z axis. You can see as long as I'm over that, if I move my hand back, the Z goes up. If I move my hand forwards, it goes down in the negative. Same thing for the Y right above it. If I put my hand up, Y axis goes up. If I move my hand down, it goes down, but never to zero because uh, the leap motion is the zero, zero in this case. So I can use this and I can use all these channels just to drive things. So I'm gonna do that real fast with this um, crazy exploding uh, cube sphere that we have created. So what I can do, let's bring these over here. Is the first thing I probably want to do is select some channels. And I could select them just like straight from here, but I'm going to probably bring it down a little bit for my sanity. So I'm going to use select. So our chop is leap motion one. And the channel names we want to grab. Right. Can I just grab them? It might be easier. Oops. Palm X. Say chop reference. Oh, I'm just gonna type them in. I've been having like a lot of trouble like clicking and dragging today. But all I need is hand zero slash palm tx. I think that's all it is. Yep. And if we scroll out, now instead of having 80 bajillion channels, we have one. And all that's doing is tracking my hand on the x axis. And what I can do is I can grab that, right? And I can make other select channels. So I'm just going to move somewhere where we have more space. So I can grab the same select node and I can just copy it and copy and paste it. And then instead of the palm TX, we could grab the palm TY and the palm TZ. And then now we have three individual channels from this leap motion controller that I can use to like say track the position of my orb in space, you know, like off of here. So like if you look in, you know, depending on what it is, the top one is TY, middle one is TX, left and right, and the other one's TZ, so back and forth. So like while I reposition my hand, I can do the same thing and reposition the orb in space. Now what you're gonna notice is that these values are way too big <laughs> for a translate. Like I'm going to like about 1000, like is about the top of like the range where I'm going. So you see, like, I just broke the 1,000 mark. If I go, like, this high, I'm, like, at 1,300. So what we're going to need is a math, right? Because we need to reorder that. So I can take a math, and I can say, okay, my range is from 0 to 1,000. It's going to be 0 to 1. And now you can see I can go from point, you know, 0 0.1 all the way up to 1, like, within the same range. So what I can do is I can take this, make a null first, Where's the null? There we go. Make a null first, and I can use this null to reference that on my uh, transform y value. So I've got my translate. So I can grab this, and all I can do is say, okay, my transform, I want to use null 3. Whoops, sorry. You have to use op, operator, null 3. Uh, and then channel zero, because there's only one. I could also call it, you know, like the call the full name, but there's no need to. 
And the reason for that is just that it's long. So I can just use the chop zero. So now, okay, that's a little too, <laughs> that's a little too, um, a little too light still. So we'll need to go back to our math node and we'll say it's a range, we'll say five. All right, so now we'll take a look. So now we're controlling this. Now I can pull it up and down, same thing. And you can see this on the comp. If I grab it, I can scale it up and down on the Y axis. And I could do this with anything, right? Put that in the supercut, you know, like I could put this with anything. So now I'm already scaling it in the Y. Let me zoom my camera out a little bit so you can see more. Yeah, just take it out a little bit. So I can pull it up or down as I go. In fact, I might just get rid of the audio uh, channel. I'm sorry, but I think it'll just make it more apparent. I love that though. That's amazing. You can still scale, <laughs> scale that up and down. Man, what are you what are you doing, Touch Designer? Okay. No, oh, I probably should put these up one, not zero. All right, there we go. So now I can take this and I can scale it and move it up and down. And then like, I'm just doing this interactively, right? Like, so you could just like mount this like anywhere and like someone can come up and mess with it. So now I'm gonna go ahead and take this and I'm gonna do the same thing for all of these to just to show how we can move in 3D space. And since it's Y, if we wanna move it up and down, we actually might wanna start it from range. Instead of zero to five, we might wanna say negative five to five. You'll see it disappears because it's not there but now we can move it up and down in 3D space, right? Like, so now we're just doing Y. That's just the Y axis, but we can also incorporate the other axes as well. We just have to get a good math for them. So if we're looking at our palm X, we're looking about, I don't know, in the range I wanna go maybe 500 to negative 500 is our math. So we'll put that in and we'll say from range negative 500 to 500 we'll go negative five to five on our translate. And then we'll output a null. And then we'll reference that null in the translate node. So it should be about the same. So instead, we can open up this translate instead, no, nope, sorry, transform. And instead of this, we'll say OP null four in the X axis. Okay. Okay, so now we should have two axes of control. Let's see what we get. Yep. And really, so now I'm moving it basically in two directions based on my hand motion. I'm moving it up and down and left and right. You know, and I can move it like wherever I want, right? And like all I'm doing is controlling this with a sensor. So you could do this with anything, right? Like like at any point. So I'm just displacing, you know, like this node we have, but I could do it with any other thing. And I'm just using the hand tracker, right? So the last thing we could do is we could also put it in Z. We could go into the Z axis as well. So I'm gonna go through and grab this math. And then a null. You could also just copy and paste this. I don't know why I'm making life harder for myself. And then what we're gonna do is just find, you know, kind of where that Z axis goes. This is a little shorter because I can't go that far. So we're gonna say like negative, maybe like negative 200 to 200 for our range. And then we're gonna plug that in and maybe we'll say, I don't know, negative five to five. That's what we've been doing. It seems to be working out. All right, and now it's harder to tell because it's shifting, but we can also move it back and forth. We might make it even actually bigger because it has to come a lot further to make it to the camera, but we can always mess with that because we've uh, set up our math. So we'll say maybe negative 20 to 20, just so we can tell. And then we also have to reference it. So actually it is doing nothing. <laughs> Sorry about that, because we have to reference the uh, null five operator. So it might actually be way too much. Let's see. Well, it's not bad. So it's coming, yeah. So now we're moving it in three axes independently. So you can see that we're moving it way far back and forth because our operator is so far. So we'll make a little adjustment to the math. We'll go back to negative five and five. So now we've just, you know, with like a pretty short operation setup, we now have this object that we can track in 3D space. 
you know, just by using our hand inputs. So like general, you can do this like with any kind of um, property, right? Like, so now we're just moving this around and it didn't have to be translated, it could be anything. So like, um, we could have done with the scale, you know, like it was mess with it. We could have made copies, you know, with it as we move, like and the amount of copies like on our instance is scaled. So we could have like plugged that in here with our instancing. Um, just there's a lot you can do, basically, is what I want to say with like all these shapes. There's just a lot of different things. Um, so other sensors that I have with me is I have also a depth camera. So we used it once earlier. I just used it basically as a webcam. Um, so I'm just going to get rid of all this because we could make it again in five seconds. Like it's not, it's not a long process to get this back. So I'm going to just delete this out and we're going to start again. All right. So from here, I'm going to unplug my leap motion by leap motion. And we're going to put in our depth camera, which is already plugged in. Cool. So the big advantage to doing using a depth camera, um, real sense. There we go. The big advantage to using a depth camera in this kind of thing is that um, a depth camera can mask out where you are, D435i, can mask out basically the background because it's doing it based reactively on the depth. So instead of color, which we just got on here, we're going to use depth. And I'm going to go ahead and export a null out. And we'll just put things in between. So let me make sure that I've got my camera like pointed in some way that makes sense. All right, we're basically going to output this null. So this is basically what the camera is seeing when it's calculating depth. As it's seeing the stuff behind me, the further back it goes, the wider it gets, and the more forward it goes, the darker it gets. So the things that are closest to the camera are black, things furthest away are white. Uh, this feed right now is pretty grainy. Um, but you can do things with it. So for one, we can set the max depth buffer, buffer and we can put it very close. So that now, instead, anything that gets close, there's just like everything, if you go back far enough, it just becomes white and isn't there anymore. We can also set a filter on it. Give it a sec, it will come up. Okay, cool. So now basically we've moved our depth of field up. Let me just make sure this is put in right. You'll notice that if I get too close to the camera, everything bogs out. It does have a minimum distance because it has two cameras that are using trigonometry to <laughs> calculate depth. So I can't get too close or it gets confused, but I can get to about here. Um, I like it better when the colors are inverted actually. So I'm going to put a levels node in here. And we're going to invert this. Yeah. And that's good because we can set an RGB key in a second that will take out the background completely. And then we can make some more changes to the filter. Yeah, this would be cool for motion capturing a stylized game. Yeah, you could use this for motion capture. You know, it's like a depth camera. Um, but real fast, let me take some whole fill. Okay. I'm just going to turn up the decimation a little bit. I just want to see. Give it a sec. It's doing stuff in the. So basically, this just makes it more low res, which is actually good for most uh, reasons in Touch Designer. You don't really need like a super high resolution resolution depth feed, unless you're like trying to calculate like someone's like face or something. Okay, and then I'm going to make some changes in my levels. I'm going to turn this black level up. Yeah, there you go, background. Get out of here. And I'm also, I want to get rid of some of this noise. You see, I've got a lot of noise on this side of the screen, like over here. So I'm going to try to get rid of some of that. So real fast. In my filter, we've got hole filling on. And we'll do some spatial hole filling as well. Yep, turn that up something like four. OK, so that's good. We still have some noise at the bottom, but I think that's overall OK. I just want to check and see. OK, yeah, nice. So now what we have is if you look through, mostly the background's gone because I set the depth filter. Like, look, I can just disappear into the background. 
and I can come back and I can make that even smaller too. So if I want to do something for like my own hand tracking, I can do something like this. Where I can bring this into the front and then go through. So now for intents of like messing with stuff, like basically I don't exist past this point, right? It's all black. So if I want to do like a hand tracking or blob tracking, I basically can use this depth camera and I can set it up and then displace it using this as my white level. So I'm going to show some of the stuff we can do with that in just a sec. I'm also going to put in a blur because this is pretty noisy and we don't need um, that much. Like we don't need like a really high resolution image if we're doing hand tracking, right? We just need something that like is like, oh, those are white pixels. And then we're also going to turn our levels up a little bit. By levels, I mean brightness, yeah. So now we get something closer to white. That's right there. And you see, we are now tracking that in space, in my body, and everything else in the room is gone. I can, you know, come in like this. Woo, you know, like a ghost. But depth cameras are really good at this. Like, if you ever need to make, like, an exhibit or something like this, you can use an RGB camera. Like, you can get close. But, like, a depth camera is really going to mask out, like, those kind of features. So, like, it's just super... Um, good if you're making something like that. And then we just need something to displace. So real fast. Um, let's just make a grid. Because I can, this is just easy to show. We're going to say 30. Kind of like my grid example at the start. 30. Um, and actually, I don't know if we need to build it from scratch. I was like wondering if I should just like import it in there. I think this is fine though. It won't be that long to make it. So we've got our grid and then we need a box. And we need some geometry. I'm just going to make this real fast. And this is going to be the same kind of thing you've seen before because we're, do we're doing the same thing again. Transform and then geo. If we've got geometry, we need a light. And we need a camera. If I can't type, it's because this room is very cold and like my fingers are getting locked up. Okay, so we got our light and our camera, and then we need our render. Sorry, render is a top, not a comp. So we've got a render right here. And we can get off our spooky feed for now and just go back to this cube. OK. So on our instance scene, we want to set, I'm just going to put a transform and a null on here. Not trans from, transform. And maybe a null. This is just kind of best practice. So I've got this as null too. So I can set this and turn instancing on. And our instance OP will be null one. Sorry, null two. Okay. And so we've got our X, Y, and Z translate along the box. And we're just gonna set up this point data. Point zero, point one, and point two. All right, so by default, that doesn't look like anything, but we've got our transform. Oops. I just want to see. Hmm. Sorry, one sec. I'm just taking a look at our camera feed. I think it's just that we need to scale this box size way down. Yeah. Box just too big. Okay, so we have this grid. Let's make it a little bigger. Yeah, man. Okay, so we have this grid right here. And I'm gonna scale in a little bit so we can see. And what we can do is we've got it already hooked up to the Y, but we can also break this. And what we can do is use this whiteness to displace. Uh, this grid, like the grid's along a point. So what I need to do is just change this camera. Let's make it even denser too. Like, so like 60 rows, 60 columns. And 
and we can do it on the Z, the Z axis is how we can displace it. Okay, so then I'm going to do, 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 scale this down again. Transform is very small at this point. There we go. We just need a lot of points to work with. Yeah, it's cold up here. <laughs> it's, it's cold in the streaming room. We've only got a few minutes left, so I'm hoping I can get this working in time. But if not, uh, you guys have been awesome, and thank you for joining. So our size is, I just need to make sure that our points correlate. So 60 by 60, that's 1,200. So we need to do a fit. So we'll do 1,200. Then 1,200. OK, and then I want to use this fit to drive it. So we need to convert this into a channel. And if anytime you want to convert stuff out, there's the top two. And then we can convert top to chop. Right there, yeah. And you can kind of see it on there. We don't need all of these because it's all one value. So I'm just going to select the R. And we're going to take it out. So chop is top to one. Channel name, R. All right, cool. So now we have our R value. Displacing. So basically, yeah, you can see it just jumps up wherever stuff is white. And you've got a grid that's running across the whole thing. So if you looked at it closely, you see that we have 1,200 points in here, 1 to 1,200. So basically what we're doing is we're displacing it along these points anywhere we go. So I want to see if I can add it in here real fast. I'm going to put in a null, a math, a math, and a null. OK. Move these back over here. And then we're going to output a constant. just need our math to go up a little higher. So really, because it looks like we go to about 1. I just want to see real fast. And then on the transform here. OK, so I'm just thinking real fast. So this is the Z and the X. So not that one. It looks like we're on the Z depth. Yeah, even that's too big. OK, so we're on the Z. So we need to go to instancing. So nothing, whoops. So nothing to set on this two. How are we doing on time? We got a few minutes left. Okay. So we've got a zero, and we just want to set basically this null three. Oops. I just want to put it on this right here on this transform, not on the instanced one. So translate Z. It's null 3. Null 3, whoops, sorry. Let's do the full one, just before we go. And if we don't get it, that's fine. It's kind of a last minute thing, but I really just wanted to give you like an idea like of, of what everything was capable of and like, OP, duh, 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 and then our op is null 3. And we are on channel R. We can just put that in. I think that's good. All right. 
Okay, so that's going to move the whole thing. So we need to put it into the instance instead. That's cool to see, though. Move it back real fast. Okay, so that's moving the whole thing. We don't want to move the entire thing. So what we want to do... Is we want to do it in here. I just want to see if I can get this in real fast. Okay. OP. Oh, that's so spooky. I'm levitating it. We'll put this back to zero. So in the instant Z, our point transformation wants to be OP. No three. R. And will this work? Uh, not quite, it looks like. I might need to put my translate OP in here. I lost it though. Hmm, I think it's because it doesn't know which one to reference. Oh well. All right, I was trying to rush it through. I didn't quite make it, so sorry to leave you guys on such a, a such a low note. But basically, all you would go in through and do is that um, I would link this up to the instant Z operation, and then it would push them, you know, based on where my hand was across the entire thing. So I just was messing up that link real fast, but um, not quite enough time to go through. So apologize, um, it would have been cool, but I basically just wanted to say thank you guys for joining in, everyone who tuned in. Uh, thank you for checking out some of these projects with me. And I hope like this gave you some ideas like kind of about Touch Designer, like how broad an interface it is and like how much you can do with it. I didn't even get into a lot of aspects of Touch Designer. Like you can use it for projection mapping or um, multi-monitor setups. Um, you can use it in conjunction with other things via Spout like that we linked to. Um, so if you ever wanted to like pull in, you know, like a game engine project, like if you build a really cool Unity or Unreal, you know, thing and you want a projection map like your game engine, you totally can. You can take it, bring in the input via Spout, still have all the controls that you're building on, like, um, you know, in the game engine and then just use Touch Designer to map it and then throw it on, like on a wall or something. So like there's just a lot of cool things you can do with Touch Designer and I just hope that this kind of like opened up like your eyes to some of the things you can do and like part of what the workflow would be like if you're making that generative architecture. Yeah. Challenging for the chat to figure out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so this has been like we didn't really walk through like a complete project, you know, like on our own. It was more of like me just like talking about how great Touch Designer is. But like, I hope that you like got like an idea from the start of it. Um, if this is popular and people are interested in it, I might do like a series where we run through like specific projects because um, these were more examples and me talking about kind of the software. But um, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. And I think I'm going to go ahead and cut the stream. Anything else uh, to say on your in chat? I'm on. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and cut to the end. And thank you for turning in. Have a great one.